Let's take three seconds to define the difference between fashion and style. So fashion is something which is decided for you by a designer. A designer uh, does two collections per year normally, maybe with the COVID it will change, and he will decide that this year you're going to wear orange or blue or whatever, or, and the skirt's going to be shorter or longer. So you don't have the hand on, your, on the fashion. You just buy what is decided f uh, for you from somebody else. Yeah, it goes as far as um, uh, using a search engine to say, oh, what, how should I do my fingernails this year? Um, oh, should I wear a belt? Exactly. Hmm. How long should my dress be? Yeah. Um, what type of shoes are in style? How about purses? So we can go far with it as women. I guess yeah. men do, do the same to some extent. Exactly the same, but it's, it's following the flock, literally following the flock and doing what other people do. Style is the exact reverse, because when you speak about style, first of all, you speak about something more timeless. And, and so style is something personal. Fashion is something personal. Global. But That's I must true. admit that sometimes we had a tendency, specifically in our community, to overuse the word style. That's true. And if you think about today, the fashion world's being turned upside down. They're even talking about going more toward the style mentality, reducing the number of collections they're doing um, just because sales are taking a dive during this difficult time. Um, so I think the fashion industry may even change the definition of fashion these days. We're going to find out. Mm, let's hope. What we're going to do today, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different because I'm going to take Uh, as, a, as a reference, an article you wrote, Sonia, I think it was in 2016 for Parisian Gentlemen, and, and the title of the article is that this, that word called style. And in this, I must say, brilliant article, you try to decipher, you try to understand, you try to, to comprehend what lays behind, what lies behind this word, what it... What, what it describe what is the definition and so what the I suggest the surprising thing about that article was the number of people that chimed in and, and who were really considering what style means to them so that yes. was surprising for us yeah oh, oh I can have the statistics here it was shared an, an enormous number of times I think we times. published around 15 of the comments yeah yeah it was too. shared like probably more than a thousand times everywhere around the, the web so let's let's uh, listen to you actually and uh, you can interject and comment whenever you want and you start this article with, a, um, with this sentence one of the most overused words other than chic and fashion has to be the word style, of course, within the realm of how we dress. We glorify the word, and that's true. In our community, even me, when I, have the, when I say fashion, because sometimes we, we can use the word fashion, people are discovering what our work, our books, our podcasts, our YouTube channel, our blog. Sometimes they write to, to me and they say, oh, you are my inspiration in fashion. And uh, sometimes we must admit, you know, we are a little bit too harsh on people because it doesn't really matter. But still... We glorify this world style. And overuse it, probably. And overuse it. Yves Saint Laurent called it eternal. Rachel Zoe, who is Rachel Zoe? Oh, she's a stylist for the stars. And yeah, Okay, so Rachel Zoe, she said, it's a way to say who you are without having to speak. And that's quite brilliant, actually. Yevgeny... Uh, Zimiatin, sorry for the pronunciation. Who, who's who's so, Yevgeny? A Russian author from the 20s, 1920s. Oh, wow. So Yevgeny, our friend, hello, Yevgeny is probably dead, <laughs> said <laughs> it is where beauty lies. That's a beautiful quote. That's something quote. you would say. Yes. Alan Fraser, of course, uh, who wrote Dressing the Man, said it endures. He may have taken that from someone else, but that was his position. Yes, yes. And that, that, that is the very, for us, this is one of the main definitions. This is uh, style endures, fashion fades. Yes. Of course, Coco Chanel said that when everything else fades, it remains. The great Audrey Hepburn said everyone has his own style. So the key word here is own Isn't style. Isn't that funny? Some people may not consider themselves stylish, but she says you still have your own style. That's so true. It is so true. We witness this on a, almost on a daily basis where people start to deep dive in our work. I have no idea how many words we wrote, how many sentences we, how many times, how many minutes and hours we spoke about style since we worked together. I don't know, millions of words for sure and hundreds of hours. So uh, we've been really, really, and we've witnessed that 
s people are writing to us to say, well, uh, thanks to you and thanks to your work, and we're very honored to receive that. I found my style. And it seems not so superficial at all. We're going to deep dive in this subject. It can be very life changing to find your own style. You then can make you, the difference of, uh, about whether someone even remembers you or not. So I think that's a strong point. Yes. Then you take the other example of Charles Bukowski. Well, <laughs> speaking of Charles Bukowski, when we speak of style, might be a little bit bizarre. Can't deny he does have a style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Charles Bukowski called it everything. He said everything is style. He, he even said that Joan of Arc had style. John the Baptist has style. Jesus had style. Socrates, Caesar, Garcia Lorca, etc. We can. Uh, I recognize Charles Bukowski. This guy is always a little bit, you know, <laughs> he overdoing. doesn't think like the rest of humanity. I would say. <laughs> yes, and uh, so you continue by writing. A common perception is that one must put a lot of thought and effort into displaying style. And you are quoting uh, a song that I adore. Uh, you write in the song. Looking for the heart of a Saturday night. So I'm not going to sing, but I'm, if I remember, it goes like, Looking for the heart of a Saturday, Saturday night. night. But I don't have the, wo the voice of Tom <laughs> Waits. It's more like, Looking be for really the raspy. heart of a Saturday, Saturday night. Something like that. <laughs> and he croons. He say, uh, these are the lyrics. He says, you comb your hair. I'm going to do it live. You comb your hair and you shave your face, no, trying to yet. wipe out every trace of all the other days in the week. You know this will be the Saturday you are reaching your peak. I love this. This so is nice. We've Tom heard Waits. this song so many times. It is so good. Orson Welles. Also, you quote Orson Welles, the immense Orson Welles, looked at style a different way, telling us it is knowing who you are, what you want to say and not giving a damn. So this is an other attitude of um, somebody who found his own style that really you do it for yourself. I'm not totally in, I'm not totally in agreement with the Orson Welles view uh, because I think that um, it's also you dress for yourself. But you also dress somehow for others. How, what do you think about that? I think it depends on your personality. I think some people really aren't interested in what other people are thinking about them. And it's almost like a genetic factor. And some people are consumed with the idea of what someone else may think about them. Mm. I used to think we're all alike, but the longer I live, I think we're pretty much different. Yeah, some people really don't care. They're At the same really time, what Orson Welles is saying that is that you can work on your own style mm -hmm. and then don't give a damn. That is to say... You put efforts, but just for yourself. It doesn't sound very true to my ear, because when you put efforts, it's not only for yourself, but also well, read the, whatever. Read what he says one more whatever. time. Read it again. So let's read continue. It, read let's, Orson's opinion again. So he I said, can... knowing who you are, what you want to say, and not giving a damn. This okay. is his definition of style. All right. Okay. Then we have, of course, Oscar Wilde. It is the passion of man's soul, which lies behind the perfection of a man's style. While Bobby Hoar, so Bobby Hoar, I think, is a... He's a hockey player from Canada. So how can you mix the thoughts of Oscar Wilde and Bobby Hoar? Well, we don't want to hear from the exact same genre <laughs> of everyone. That's not interesting. This is very... very Some I, people like hockey. You are very bold, darling, to, to mix the, the Oscar Wilde and a Canadian hockey player. But the, this Canadian Bobby Hoar said, forget about style, worry about results. So probably it was not very beautiful um, uh, to see, you know, he didn't have much style with his cross, you know, on the eyes, but he was, as far as I understand, extremely efficient. He produced. He produced. He, he was delivering, as we yes. say, in France. <laughs> and um, Toba Beta, Toba Beta, uh, remind me. A young, it's just a young author. You can it's look from at, Indonesia. Yeah, exactly. An Indonesian exactly. young author alludes to incorporating style into whatever you do, explaining... Quote, even if all you can do is a bad thing, well, at least do it with your style. Yes. Well, that's a good so attitude. So whatever you're, you're doing, try to do it with style. We're not telling you what to do. We wouldn't ever try to tell you what to do, but you can at least consider your choice of what you do as doing it with style. style. Well, 
Can you imagine we're speaking about one world since already 12 minutes? Wild. Yeah, it's wild. We hope you That's like it because we are totally passionate with that and we try to give a meaning to all this. That's, right. That's exactly what, this is our objective. Try to give a meaning and, and try to understand even our own obsession. Why are we so obsessed with style and, and being stylish and being so nonchalant in our style? We're going to come to this a little bit later. Let's continue reading what you wrote. Isn't it fun to listen to somebody reading what you wrote? It's kind of an out-of-body experience. Yeah, it's a little, maybe I carry it far, but strange it is. So, to add more of a twist, in order for you to describe in your own words what style means, your explanation itself will be dependent upon your own style. That's very true. In this brief essay, wow, it's brief essay, I hope, because the introduction is quite <laughs> long already. It's not that much longer, don't worry. You write, I would like to offer two techniques to try in developing your own style, beginning with a method called heuristics uh, and ending with a revelation specific to finding your style by E.B. White. Who is E.B. White? Well, there was a, a book called Elements of Style. Every person who aspired to be a journalist is required to read this book. So E.B. White wrote it, but then it was later revised. Okay, by, by strong... somebody said, so, um, so we say ending with a revelation Specific to finding your style by E.B. White, discussed in his 1959 enlarged and re revised work by William Strunk Jr. Yes. In his dissertation, in his paper, The Elements of Style, yeah, from 1918. Put this famous uh, work together that we all must read if we're going to be journalists. Oh, yeah. And uh, remind the people, you did your major in journalism. That's right. Uh, in the uh, University of Georgia? Yes, Henry Grady School of Journalism in Athens, oh, wow. Georgia University. Yes. Not like Cosmos here, who's, who's doing our production. He's from actually from Athens, Greece. This is oh, yeah. Athens, Georgia. Oh, Athens, a bit different. Georgia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not from Greece. So there's right. Athens in Georgia. So, the first chapter, you explain the heuristic technique. Let's try to um, uh, define what it is, this heuristic technique. You write, referred to as heuristic, this technique is, is any approach to discovery, problem solving, or learning using a method not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect, but sufficient for immediate goal. So it's like very um, concrete, right? The heuristic approach. How yes. would you define it? Uh, well, I mean, in my own words, I would just say that a lot, I'll go back to an example of someone who overthinks something over worries about something is consumed with fear about you know how the outcome will will be um, who just is so into their own mind their cerebral thoughts and considerations of outcomes that they don't get anything done mm -hmm. so with a heuristic approach you sort of try to release those uh, feelings of fear and concern and go with more your intuition, the natural way of doing things. You yes. just leap forward, yes. do it, willing to accept the results. Yeah. And you end up learning more in some instances this way than if you overthink something. So if I translate this in a simple sentence, it's also accepting making mistakes. Yes. In order to deliver immediate results. And the mistakes become the great teacher because mm. you know intuitively how you felt when you did whatever you did. Yeah. Plus you get feedback from others. Mm. And so if you're not too concerned about your own ego and you can mm. receive that feedback, it can be a great way to learn and move forward. So let's try to translate this in our world of, of style and how the way you dress. And I can testify this is a very good approach. Because so many people put so much efforts and thoughts and I re we receive so many messages saying, Mr. Jacomet, I have this uh, off-white jacket. Do you think it's better to have a pocket square with this kind of pattern? And I, my answer is always the same. Try it. Just try it. Perfect, yeah. Put it on. And uh, you have already the mirror in front of you that will tell you part of the truth. And then if you're not sure, go outside or go and meet your friends. Make mistakes. This is how you define your own side. You have to try, try, try. And for example, never choose, for example, never choose a tie or a pocket square on the rack mm. because you can fall in love with a tie or a pocket square. But when you put it on, it, that, it doesn't work. And on the contrary, some very strange patterns and you look at that in the window and say, oh, I will never wear that stuff. You, you, you remember yeah, we have oh, so yes, many, many examples times. of You're that. trying to project out how it will look yeah. when you, it's almost impossible to do in many instances. You have to actually put it on your body with what you would normally wear and then it's 
it's going to answer the question for you. You don't yeah. even have to answer it yourself. And sometimes it works perfectly and you would not, never have believed. A second thing, and I don't want to go against people who are salesmen or sell assistant in some shops, but also the heuristic approach makes you understand that you are your best judge or do it with your wife or with your companion or whoever, but you are your best judge. And sometimes it's better to trust your own judgment than to follow blindly the advice of others. Am I a little bit um, rough on well, people? Well, I, I, I don't know, because, you know, a lot of times we try to, we look in the mirror and we see ourselves or we have a picture and we see ourselves and we think, oh, this that's is a right. really bad picture. And then I'll say, You're right. uh, and you'll go, no, that's not, that's a great picture. Yeah. And the way I see it and the way you see it could be totally different. So when you're all alone in a dressing room and you step out, sometimes you want the opinion oh, of okay. the sales. Right. You know what? I have asked before, I've just gotten to the point where I'll just ask, no, nothing personal, but are you getting a commission on your sales? I'm just curious. Um, if you don't mind my asking, and if you do, never mind. And so usually they'll say yes or no. Mm -hmm. If they say no, then I might be take what they say a little more um, seriously. Mm. Then, because no, your motivation what, is key, right? Yeah, what I wanted to say, that's fantastic people who are doing a great job, who have very good. But the thing is that not two people have the exact same style. It's that I wanted to say. So sometimes they, even a sales assistant can have some reflex that it's yes. one size fits all that and work with establishing your own Yes, style. remember when we went to Anne Fontaine yeah. and we had a, a, a Russian. Oh, Anne so Fontaine. At, it's a, it's a, it's a, a shirt woman. maker in France for women only. Beautiful. Beautiful white shirts. Yeah. And this woman, she helped me so much. She found two, two shirts immediately. It would have taken me two hours to find those two shirts exactly. because of her experience. So it depends yeah. on the situation. Exactly. Let's go back to the heuristic technique and see what Sonia Glynn, the one and only, is writing on the subject. So it's about not a perfect technique, but achieving immediate goals. Whenever finding an optimal solution is not practical or possible, as in finding, for example, your style, because it's a long journey. It's a long, long journey. And it's not even, a, there's no destination. It's a permanent journey. Uh, then you say a, a heuristic approach is a mental shortcut to ease the cognitive load of making a decision. Guestimates, rule of thumbs, common sense, and relying on one's intuition based on past experience are examples of a heuristic approach. I've used heuristics for years in writing. For example, my first draft can be rough, and after a few go rounds of editing, I will choose to publish before falling prey to the overworking an article. Oh my gosh, I, I can relate you can, to you've this. You've done this as well. Yeah, I can relate to this very easily because so many people are overworking an article. And you know what is the result most of the time when you overwork it's an article? It's worse than if you'd stopped earlier. It's not only that, it's that it, you empty your article of its originality. Mm. And I've been learning this so many times that when you are revised and revised and revised, at, at the end, you lost your soul almost. This mm. is very, and I think it is the same in men's style. When you dress and you you want, or, and in style in general, when you dress and you want to refine and refine and refine, you just miss and you you lose your original intention. That's right. And, and you know what the point of this section is just jump in there and do it. You know, if you're not a good writer and you need to express something on paper, you probably will never write what's in your mind, yes. but maybe you need to get what's in your mind onto paper. So if you release all that cognitive load and just write it without worries about all the mistakes and the insults you might get from others, you get your thoughts out there. And then if you want to move forward and remedy it to make it more presentable, you can. Because we you, we're relating this to dressing too. Oh yeah, you exactly. Understand. Yes. When developing a personal style, we should not hesitate to produce results because we are afraid of making mistakes. Instead, we have the freedom to sift through the wrangling of our minds like a prospector. You're very dramatic on this one. I'm going to put music. Let's put music a little bit. I, I do it again because I like this <laughs> moment. <laughs> so you say, when developing a personal style, we should not hesitate to produce results because we are afraid of making mistakes. Instead, we have the freedom to sift through the wrangling of our minds, like a prospector rotating a pan of water full of gravel and sand. 
in search of specks of gold. I'm sorry, I'm French. You can notice my accent. I hope it you can understand. It makes it better. What are you talking about? Let's continue. Don't be afraid to show the gravel and sand of your self-expression. Refinement will come after you've relaxed enough to be willing to make some mistakes. As a side note, a sister technique to heuristics is called the stream of consciousness technique, mamma mia, <laughs> a narrative approach in which you, we can depict multi, multitudinous feelings and thoughts passing through the mind, expressing whatever thoughts are flowing without filtering or thinking too much. The above represents a great approach to finding your personal time. You are a poet and you are a fantastic that, you know, writer. Virginia Woolf used stream of consciousness to write. Literally just, oh, just like, I hate to use this term, but it just came to my head, just vomiting out all these words. And then, <laughs> you know, some of it she just left. She edited nothing. And, and a lot of people love to sift through her writings. But you continue with a very important idea. You said, the idea is to avoid becoming an overguarded dresser as a result of fear. Fear to venture outside of your own parameters. Fear of the judgment of others. Fear of regretting deviation from doing things the way most everyone else does them. This is so relevant today, darling, what you write, because this is... I remember so many people, and I'm so happy we've been an inspiration with other people in our trade for uh, young men, for example, to really go for it. But I, we still receive letters to say, oh, you know, it's difficult because what my colleagues will think, what my friends will think, they're going to mock me. And then we witness that little by little, the young generation, they don't give a damn anymore. They do it because they like it. And I, I, I adore this. Idea. We have seen that a lot, but you know, you have to address one thing that's very important, and that is a lot of us have anxiety, and it's just almost the way that we are wired. So just telling someone, don't worry about that, just go out there and intuitively dress, you know, go for classic style, you'll learn. No, you can't do that. If, as a person who knows what anxiety feels like, yes. it's really something that just takes practice, just letting go a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little exactly. bit at a time, and then finally you reach somewhere around where you want to be. I agree totally with you. And you say... To finish this paragraph, as a small example, during this period of free expression, your eyes are open to try things like a bow tie or a tie pin, but won't, won't that harm the fabric? Yeah. For example, I'm, I'm, this is a lapel pin I'm wearing here. I hope it shows on the camera. I have a lapel pin here on, on, on my, uh, it's not, yeah, it's a lapel pin. Yes, and the I first, know. in order yes. to pinch it, it, to put it, you have to, to pick the fabric. And we have so many people asking, how oh, is it going to da damage the fabric? No, it doesn't damage the fabric because it is a needle. So you say, um, um, sometimes you're afraid and you start learning what pleases you instead of becoming locked into a shrunken universe. Before you know it, you'll find yourself honing in on a wardrobe that really suits you, buying less once you understand what pleases you more. This is a fundamental, I repeat, you will all of a sudden find yourself, because you've been establishing your own style, the way you love to see yourself dressed, and so you're going to buy less once you understand what pleases you more. And this is extremely important. And now after that, darling, you speak about the personal experience. Do you remember this personal yes, experience? Yes, you don't really have to read it word for word. I can just... Um, uh, Explain that. We're going to show, if you look at YouTube, we're going to oh. show this picture of Sonia, the first PT woman oh, we did together. I did total heuristic. I'm in like... 2012. Otherwise, I could not have walked out of the hotel room. So I just put together what I had, okay? Yeah. Uh, but I ended up really liking it. It's the only suit I had out of two. We were going to PT Womo. I put on my fuchsia pink suit. I put a crazy tie that I just pulled out of the closet. I didn't know how to do a pocket square, so I did some strange fold, put the pocket square <laughs> there, went out the door. Yeah. And it was an enormous success. Well, it's, you know, you no, can no, find No, 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 honestly, honestly, that was really, people said, who is this woman with a pink suit and a yellow 
with a it's, it's a, a, regiment, tie, a regimental, a regimental tie, tie, right? And we were together. My hair, you can see on the photo, was so long, and we were just, you know, how do you say? I whistle. I whistle. Yeah, you're whistling. Yeah, it's a, no, try to be as nonchalant as possible, which is almost impossible. We were, I had, it was I had, our first time. We I didn't know what we were doing. To here, and you had a pink suit. <laughs> yes, and we were trying crazy. to be nonchalant. So, say. so anyway, the whole point is making it short. A uh, so long story short is that from that experience, I started understanding how I felt about dressing that way and made adjustments. Yeah. Anyway, let's continue and finish this article. So uh, it just goes, progresses to show what almost 10 years later, how, yeah, how It's I actually dress. eight years later All and right. you say have passed and now I know that I prefer tone on tone dressing, shade on shade. Explain to us what you mean. This is so one of your specialties. I went from a pink suit to going to monochromatic dressing, mm. which is using the same color in different shades or sticking to two colors. And uh, it's just a soothing uh, look that I really enjoy. And this changed the way that I dress. I can get dressed much faster because I know what I like. And I think that's another benefit. It's time saving over the years because you understand what you like. And you finish this um, part saying a beautiful sentence. You say, making the efforts to express yourself as you are without filters Overthinking or too many revisions may result in looking error-ridden at first, but with practice, you'll find yourself running through the refiner's fire with each path through the fire giving a better result as you become an intuitive dresser with a unique, individual, one-of-a-kind style. And this is, I could, I could have, I, I can't write better than that. Honestly, this That's is kind. in a few sentences, Everything we try to say on everything we do in the case is perfectly summed up in this sentence. And then you continue by something which is very important and, and that a lot of people should reflect on. I don't say a lot of people, but we know some people, they put too much thought on what they do concerning style. You say, to achieve style begin by affecting none. Now, let's define the words a little bit. So we now, you say, we now arrive at a more advanced revelation about style taken from a book which was required reading before I could earn my journalism degree. Uh, the book is Elements of Time by William Strunk Jr., the revision, the guy who did the revision for the book of E.B. White, addressing style from the wo the viewpoint of writing. I use most of, I, I, it happened to me many times to use this comparison between the way you write and the way you dress. Really? Yes, yes, because you know, I'm a great admirer of Gustave Flaubert, you for are. example, because it's for me the, the epitome of style. This guy, but he was putting a lot of thoughts in it, but at the end, his style was so fluid. So you see the relationship between putting thought and how people Look at you, and uh, this is the definition of sprezzatura. You can put a lot of thought, but you should l look for nonchalance. And that's Flaubert in style. He's a fantastic writer. He will sometimes spend two days to, to, to find the right word, one word on the sentence. But when you read it, it is so fluid that it's evident that only this word was meant to be in this sentence. The impression that you just gave me is, wouldn't it be great if everyone could relate to the writing that they prefer yes. and see if they can pull in some type of similarities with how they prefer to dress. Mm -hmm. I bet you in most cases it is, there is a relationship there. Yeah, that's right. That's a good idea. Let's, let's, let's deep dive a little bit on that. And you, well, first of all, uh, why tells us something is sell to achieve style begin by affecting none. So let's define affectation. Because uh, we have to be very precise with the words. So affectation, you say, it's from the dictionary. You said behavior, speech, or writing that is pretentious and designed to impress. So I see so many people say dress to impress. This is probably the thing with which I disagree the most. Uh, if you dress to impress, uh, uh, we don't speak about style. We speak about, we speak about something else. This is a major concept It's almost for an us. exhibition. Yes, it's, uh, um, well, you can dress to be at your best. You can dress to look handsome if you go on a date or pretty. You can dress to be at your best. But ah, dressing to impress is something which is, it's, it's, it's a kind of a phrase, a sentence that a lot of people are using. 
That's I'm not true. really in agreement. Well, think about that. we're correlating writing. You know, when you read something, we call it purple writing. Yes. When someone adds, uh, it's almost like they wrote every sentence with a thesaurus. Yes. They found a word <laughs> that they use uh, commonly, and they think I got to put a fancy word there, so mm-hmm. they'll look in their thesaurus. Mm-hmm. And and at the end of the article or the writing piece, you your head spinning. You can't even get through it because yeah. you feel like you need a dictionary, yeah. or it doesn't have the rhythm in French. You that guys makes, love yeah. to keep the rhythm in French. Exactly. People who put too many affectations, mostly they're not, mm. most likely they're not French. Uh, specifically scholars, actually, when uh, I've been listening to so many theses, you know, in France, when you do a thesis for a PhD, this is public. So you have to explain your thesis. You say your thesis, yes, right? Yes, thesis. To become a doctor of whatever. Exactly. Sociology or philosophy. Oh, yes. And there's an affectation there oh, yes. because they try to use as, most, as, as much as they can complex words, even if the, the sentence has no meaning at the end, but the number of complicated words you use uh, becomes almost their obsession. But this, this is another story. Oh, very uh, good point. Yeah, we, 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 and this is exactly what you should, if you translate it into dressing, don't do that. Don't yeah, overcomplicate things. We've met people who, uh, you know, we've seen for the first time. And I think they're really trying a, a lot because, I don't, I'm not saying because they're meeting us, but because we're in this field and yeah. they think we're looking at them. Yes. So they'll put, what, the tie pin, the tie bar, the lapel pin, the scarf, the gloves, the glasses. Too and much. wow, there's a lot of items there. And so maybe if you can just try taking off an item or two yeah. and seeing uh, the elegant specter come through after yeah. you do that. I, I give you an example today. Normally, I, I never, never present myself in front of you without a pocket square. But as I put on this lapel pin, which is, uh, well, actually, it's an animal painting, mi- fantastic, by this Russian artist. I don't remember. Zenia, she's in one of uh, the other broadcasts. Zenia was an X, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yes. it's a detail of a painting from Toulouse-Lautrec. I think it's from Le Moulin de la Galette, or something, you know, this, uh, I think Toulouse-Lautrec was popularized um, um, uh, in your country with this film on Moulin Rouge. Exactly. Uh, Baz, Baz Luhrmann. And uh, Baz Ullmann, Baz Luhrmann, I'm, I'm not sure about the name of the director, fantastic film. And so this thing, if I would have put on, I, I tried it, to put a uh, pocket square on top of it, it would have been too much, you know? That's right. Because I also have, oh, I'm sorry for the sound, you see here? Yes. It's a tie bar. So a tie bar, a lapel pin, it would be too much because pocket square. So don't go too far. This is a good example. I'm sorry I'm speaking about myself. Yeah, you myself. don't want to look like a fireworks show. Exactly. Or like a Christmas tree right. with exactly. too many things on it. And uh, I'm sorry, this is French humor. I know you don't like the, 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 the yeah, Christmas do. tree. I so do. you say the definition, the affectation of a man who measures every word for effort or the second definition is a studied displays of real or pretended feeling, an affectation of calm, that you pretend to be nonchalant and very at ease in your clothes, but in fact, you are not. And then you say something that I love. This is the last part of your, we uh, reach the last part of your Let me just throw article. in, I'm, yes. I don't want to go too far, but I want you to understand that a lot of people have to do this, fake it till you make it, just to get through the day. But we're saying that, Try not to keep faking it. It's okay at first if you have to fake it till you make it, but fi- try to find a place where you don't have to fake anymore, where you can be natural. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's funny because I just stepped back from our discussion and I said, we're talking about dressing, but you understand that this is not the subject. It's almost a pretext that we take to speak about something else. And this is why more and more people understand that. The way you dress is not secondary. What I discovered specifically in America where we live together, I would say four months per year, four to five months per year, uh, I've seen so many people saying, oh, I don't care really the way I dress. I, I go, you know, uh, the right. famous advertisement by McDonald, come as you are, you know. And, but <laughs> what you discover if you really take a closer look, what do they do? In fact, they all dress the same. So yeah. they not only, it, 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 they say they don't care about the weather. It's not true. Because they all have this same shirt by Columbia with Vans. You're talking about Americans. Yeah. Yes. They all have right. the same, same shirt. Same haircut. Same haircut. Yes. Same chino. Same, same shoes. thing. So mm-hmm. saying that they don't care the way they're dressed, it's, it's a lie. It's they care about 
dressing the wear other dresses as if they wanted in consciously I don't know if it's conscious that or is a great point but That's they follow point. the trend they follow the flock so they do care so they do care ah uh, you understand and I why see. if you do care admit it and try to find your own style it can pay my friends listen to me enormous dividends in life it doesn't mean suit and tie we are speaking here about classic style but you can find your own style in any kind of dressing but this is not superficial you finish by saying something like that mr white this is the guy who wrote this book in 1918 like to sip a vermouth cassis before lunch no it's actually not this is a different this is just an example of a fictional writing which is a really cool point so read it's not the same mr white this is an example of a fictional oh okay um, piece it's very a, a so because i like this he said the guy say it's a french taxi driver's drink he said in six words he encapsulated a thought that could take a full paragraph to describe but talk about the alcohol at the beginning read the whole thing from mr white Uh, I don't have it from Mr. White. You I'm just sorry. said Mr. White. It, it in, says Mr. White. And he's talking about the vermouth that you put in the martini. Yes. So it's a this really simple alcohol. And the writer's trying to explain what it's like to drink this alcohol. Yes. So he describes the drink and he says, it's a, ta it's a French taxi driver's drink. Mm. That's all he needed to say. Yeah. He didn't need to go into three paragraphs about the simple drink. He just said, it's a French taxi driver's drink. If I tell you this is a French taxi driver's drink and I, I give you the drink, yeah. what are you going to think? Uh, that I have to pay. <laughs> no, you. the point is you're going to think it's a very simple drink. Maybe not too sophisticated. Ah, okay, I understand that. Well, we have some sophisticated taxi drivers now. Let's, let's move <laughs> forward. In dressing with style, it's not different. You can express that you like vintage with one item. I understand what you want to say. Or six items. But many times, one item is enough to get the message across without wearing paragraphs. I like the way you write. You don't have to overdo it. You know, when I wear this type in, you understand, I like vintage feeling because this is from Moulin La Gadette, Toulouse Lautrec, the old Paris yes. with the Moulin Rouge. It says everything immediately. You continue and you finish by saying, it is this truth in dressing that unveils a secret to expressing style. Avoid, by all means, affectations. And I think this is a lesson we can learn in any sectors of life. Yeah. Avoid, It applies to a lot of different areas. Oh my gosh. Avoid affectations. Yes. It can go also the way you decorate your house. It can go the way you, I don't know, you want the way you decorate your garden, uh, the way you receive others at your home, the way you behave with others, the way you celebrate your birthday of your child, the way, wow, you know, this that's affectation. That's a good one. Yes. You know, that's as if you were displaying continuously how powerful and perfect you are Nobody's and that doesn't put people at ease you're always saying put people at ease always. put people at ease always. and that you know is a part of what you're saying that if you go too far with affectations yeah. you do not put people at ease putting people at ease is for me one of the key definition of elegance yes an elegant man or even a gentleman has this first quality putting other at ease in his presence and not monopolizing the discussion and not putting all the light on himself. So by definition, avoiding every kind of affectation. That's the, the, the holy grail in terms of style to reach. And you finish to say, unless you are dressing for a reenactment of the French Belle Epoque era or for the civil war movement, uh, if it doesn't feel honest when you wear it, then evolve to wearing what feels authentic to you, authentic to you. On the opposite spectrum, fashion, not style, is a total embrace of affectation, and that's another definition of fashion. You embrace affectations and trying to make a statement with affectation. You can be fashionable alongside thousands of others simply by knowing trends. You can make a, a fashion statement by wearing something the status quo deems slightly uh, outlandish. If fashion is your passion then the pursuit of true style uh, may not be your forte that's for sure 
And then you say, and it's the very last paragraph, but if the pursuit of true style is what you are after, and I hope that if you listen to this program, this is what you are looking for, uh, then hone on in cracking the mask you may be wearing in order to express a specific style unique to who you are and begin by affecting none. If anyone in the field has understood the power of avoiding affections, it must be Hugo Jacomet. No, sorry. <laughs> it must be Coco Chanel who tells us, before you leave the house, look in the mirror and remove one accessory. Huh? Okay, we translate less is more. This is a marketing thing right. these days. But she always say that. Look in the mirror and remove one. This is exactly what I did today before yes. doing this episode. I removed my pocket square. Instead of adding something, try to remove. Of exactly. course, if you are in your bathing suit, well, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Finally, if you picked up the word on the word begin in White's edict above, then you have been astute in your observation with the beginning of a new year if you agree but uh, what better time to begin to see things anew about listening to this podcast for example what a good occasion to start things anew by steering clear of affections in all parts of life clear of pretentious attitudes or the intent to impress no longer pretending but rather expressing yourself exactly as you are are something no one else can do better than you. I have to put a little bit of well piano done. because thank I'm going to cry. <laughs> it's so beautifully written. Very kind. Thank so you. So thank you. This was, I must admit, well, you, my wife, we're together since almost a decade. Uh, I just rediscover your writing. You're freaking good writer, I must say. Thank you. And the, the, you are very unique in the way you can, exchange, you can really cover some subject. This is not easy, you know, to cover this subject without being yourself, uh, the subject of affectation. This is a very, very interesting. So if you want to read this article, it's called This World Called Style. It's on our blog on Parisian Gentleman. See you soon. See you uh, soon. An appointment to the next episode of Sotorial Talks. Bye-bye, my friend. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.